I was working full time. I got two master's degrees um, while working full time and just doing everything I could to kind of improve myself. And um, and like like I was getting like a 3% raise. Welcome to the Next Level Income Show, where it's our goal to take your income, your investments, and your life to the next level. I'm your host, Chris Larson. If you haven't yet, get a copy of our book for free at our website, nextlevelincome.com. That's www.nextlevelincome.com. Just click on the book link and I'll even send you a copy if you put your address in. On today's show, we have Chad Sedanek. Chad is the founder and CEO of CSQ Properties. He's a rocket scientist turned entrepreneur turned real estate guru, and his career spanned 25 years. But the last seven years, he's built a multifamily and self-storage portfolio to over $85 million through syndication and personal investing. Today, Chad's not only going to share his story, but he's also going to share how you can get a free copy of his book, Why Entrepreneurs Should Invest in Apartments. Chad, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Super excited. Absolutely, man. It was great to see you in person last week. And and here we are virtually. We should have just figured out a way to do it live last week, huh? <laughs> next time, <laughs> next better planning. Yeah. I'm really excited to have you on because you really bring uh, a really overlapping, not only skill set, but experience in being an engineer, being an entrepreneur, being a real estate investor. And we have a lot of listeners that are going to be able to relate to the one, two, or maybe even all three of your experiences here on the show today. Um, so uh, as some people heard in the intro, they heard about um, you know your, uh, your engineering background, but I'd love for you to share firsthand, Chad, a little bit about your background and um, how you ended up where you are today. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we also have the uh, the MBA and cycling in common too. So we've got a lot to talk about if we get bored with real estate, but I don't think that'll happen. <laughs> That's right, man. So, uh, so yeah, so I started out as a special engineer, actually uh, working on the space shuttle main engines of all things. So uh, technically a rocket scientist, uh, did that for seven years and uh, went into business with my brother. Uh, we owned a, a lighting business. Um, I was also in construction for a bit for a couple of years, construction management, got my general contractor's license um, and my professional engineer's license, and then did the lighting business for uh, over 15 years uh, before before I sold it and uh, and then went in full time as an investor uh, slash general partner in real estate. And I've uh, been doing that ever since. And that was in uh, in 2018. Awesome, man. Awesome. Um, yeah, I always, I always like to say, like, I always felt stupid because I was, I was in engineering school, and here I am, and you know, with these PhD candidates, and we did a very, I did a very theoretical, um, kind of base program, engineering, science, and mechanics, and then end up working in the medical device industry. So I'm in the room with neurosurgeons, and now, you know, you kind of put me in the same spot, Chad. Here I am with a rocket scientist, you know. So I, you know, again, I'm, I, I like to be, I like to be the uh, the least intelligent person in the room. You know, it always kind of, <laughs> I feel like it elevates your game. Um, so. Yeah, I guess first off, tell us about how and why you transitioned, you know, out of you know that role, that W two role, into being an entrepreneur. I think a lot of people think, hey, this is you know, this is sexy. I want to do this, um, but you know, there's there's pluses and minuses to that. Yeah, look, and I think I think it's different for everybody, whatever they're you know drawn to. But like for me, I've I've always been an entrepreneur at heart. Um, I've helped found or start six different businesses. Um, but I'll tell you what, when I was working, uh, at Boeing on the space shuttle main engine, like super, you know, uh, flashy, elaborate, you know, like I was proud of where I worked and what I was doing. Right. It, it was amazing. Yeah. And, and you briefly mentioned be, you know, work, be in a room with people than you. That was me. Like <laughs> these guys were like super smart. You know, I started working there when I was 21. I didn't know anything. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, and these guys have been there for like 30 years, just like super, super smart people. And uh, and it was great. And um, but the thing was, is in corporate America, at least where I was at, um, you know, I was really I felt like I was really busting my chops. Um, I was working full time. I got two master's degrees um, while working full time and just doing everything I could to kind of improve myself. And um and like, like I was getting like a 3% raise and like the, the, the total slackers were getting like 1% or 2% raise. And I'm like, I'm busting my chops 
to, you know, do the best I can and I'm getting 4% and they're getting one or 2%. Like it just, it just didn't make sense. Right. Yeah. So that was like pretty irritating for me. Um, and I, for me, I wasn't going to like slow down how hard I worked. I just wanted to be compensated a little bit better. So I went back to my entrepreneurial roots and uh, started uh, a business with my brother and, uh, and we grew that, um, you know, we grew that from nothing to about 75 people in three different uh, warehouse locations in LA. Um, it was a good sized oh. business. We were, you know, yeah. doing really well. Um, and what, but one thing, like, we had always wanted to get into real estate, like, maybe on a side business then, but because yeah. uh, we'd known so many clients that were really successful in real estate. And you always hear about, about the tax advantages and the leverage and stuff like that, that makes it such an uh, advantageous industry to be in. But we just never did it because we were so busy working on the business. Yeah. Um, so then when I finally exited, it gave me the opportunity to finally go after it. And, um, and I almost, I just got kind of tired of myself saying, I need to get into real estate. I really should be doing real estate. I got tired of telling myself that story. So I just jumped in, I jumped in with both feet and, uh, and it's been amazing. I, I, I love it. And for a lot of the things I'm sure we'll talk about in this, in this podcast, um, uh, but it, it's been an amazing journey and super rewarding. Yeah. that's awesome. When, when was that first deal that you did? Tell us about the, about the first real estate deal that you did. So, yeah, so it's a bit unique, actually. Um, so my first deal was in uh, 2019 uh, as an active GP, but I did it solo GP. So I did like everything from A to Z. It was a 10 unit building in Long Beach. Um, it was like a two and a half million dollar deal. Um, so it was like a big deal for my first syndication yeah. by myself. I, I raised uh, 1.2 million for it. Um, and it was it was definitely stressful, <laughs> uh, definitely stressful. Even though like I had you know a lot of real type of experience, business experience, but when you start working with other people's money, and you know yeah. this better than anybody with everything you've done, it's it's a big it's a big responsibility. Um, so I probably like overdid it on everything just so I could make sure that I I left nothing nothing behind as. And like you and I, we just saw Jesse Itzler, right, at our oh, conference yeah. last weekend. And what did he say? He said, make sure you don't leave anything in the tank, right? Nothing you left yeah. in the tank. And if you do that, you won't have any regrets. And that's kind of like how I lived my life. And uh, I know you're the same way with bike racing we in common. Um, and, and you don't leave anything in the tank, and then you don't have anything to regret. And I could face my investors, good, bad, or indifferent. I could face my investors, know that I gave it everything I could because – at the end of the day, these are investments. There are risks, right? And in today's world, yeah. we're starting to see some of those risks pop up more than we've seen in the last several years. So, um, so with that, I was able to. Uh, I did well, you know, got it across the line. We own own the um, the uh, asset today. It cash flows every month, um, nice. and we're doing really well with it. But man, it was it was a little nerve wracking first time around. Yeah, so that was your that's that's a pretty good sized deal for your first deal. Did you invest in anything else as a passive investor? Did you buy any like residential properties before that, Chad? Um, yeah, yeah. So I did do a bit of that uh gotcha. passively. Yeah. Um, and then and then I did own properties, uh investment properties on my own. Um so so yeah, I did know some of that, but again, when you're working with other people's money and and uh, they, they move fast, these deals move fast. Yeah. Um, you know, back in, in 2019, like, like you had, there's no contingency, right? No appraisal contingency, no financing contingency. Yeah. Like you basically had 10 days for inspection and that was it. And then you're off to the races and like it's all yeah. my EMD money that was hard on the deal already. So, uh, a, a little, a little nerve wracking. Um, yeah. I was the biggest investor on the deal, um, which is fine, but I, I still, still raised 1.2 million. Um, and uh, it was it was very interesting. So I, I did I've done several like solo general partner deals. Yeah. Um, which I think is pretty rare, especially early on in this space. Um, but I learned a lot, so super grateful. And now I'm I'm co GPing on larger deals. Um, but it's nice to have that background of of yeah. being I've done everything from A to Z. Yeah, I think it's important to be able to understand that. And you know, I think you know you don't have to go from 
I was at a meeting a couple of weeks ago and uh, did a did a talk with um, a friend of mine, and we talked about kind of like the continuum. You know, starting with a single family property, maybe moving up to a small multifamily property, um, moving up to like a value add property, and then kind of scaling from there. I don't, you don't have to necessarily do that, but I think it is important to to wrap your hands around the process of you know a like you said like a ten unit. That's a great size to get the feeling of all the different aspects, you know, from, you know, the initial due diligence period, raising the capital, you know, in- implementing what, what, when was that property built? Was that a value add property you did with that, Chen? Yeah, it was a value yeah. add and it was, uh, it was old. It was like yeah. uh, 1930. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was old, but yeah, I mean, it, we fixed it up really nice. We had uh, maybe a half a million dollar construction on it. Yeah. Um, and uh, we got everything, you know, leased up afterwards, and it, it turned out really well. Awesome. But going back to that continuum um, theory that you mentioned earlier, I think I think part of that is like like you and I share this, right? As as engineers, yeah. like we we're very analytical, and um, and there's this risk mitigation that we do just very naturally in our heads, right? Like we yeah. can get numbers, we can understand risks, make kind of decisions based on that. And uh, the the continuum mention or, or kind of just scaling up over time, like that's a, that's good for engineers, right? Because you take this, yeah. I get this, okay, now I'm ready to do this, and you keep moving. Um, but like, not everyone's like that. Like, some people yeah. would jump into that. Like, I had a lot of experience, so like, I felt more comfortable doing you know solo GPing my first deal. Yeah. Um, but some people that don't don't do that. And the risk level is really high. And I think yeah. those are those types of deals you got to be careful. Just you have to understand the risk level you have. It may work out fine, but there's probably some some risk there that you're taking if you if you don't uh, move along that continuum, as you mentioned. Yeah. And I think like our first big deal was our first syndicate deal was a hundred units. It was about a nine million dollar deal. And we did a uh, partnership with um the original group that we were investing with my my first partner and i and that was nice because again like you said i think it's hard for people like risk is not something statistics it's not something that our human brains naturally grasp and i think when you're when you're used to dealing with kind of numbers and you know not being emotional about things and for me you know being in the or and kind of being forced to to kind of push aside emotion and just deal with things on a regular basis um, as well as being trained as an engineer, right? We're just constantly looking at numbers and a lot of engineers aren't even good with people, right? Like they have a hard time talking to people. Um, so uh, yeah, it's something that, that probably comes more naturally uh, to us. But, you know, getting back to that point, I think human beings, we're just not good at evaluating risk, you know, or mm-hmm. especially looking at um, risk to reward, right? Um, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that. No, but it is hard to wrap your arms around. Um, I think some of that comes from experience. Yeah. Um, You know, understand risks. And, you know, once you go through some cycles and you see some things, then you you understand risk a lot better. Like, oh, there is that risk that I didn't really realize was there initially. Yeah. Uh, So it comes with experience. But what's interesting, and and you probably saw this on on your first deal. I know you started a bit before me. But, you know, when you co-GP'd on a really large deal, like it wasn't all on your shoulders, right? So you knew there's some risk there. Maybe yeah. you, you know you really fully understand the risk, but you got a good team together that you yeah. probably knew, like, and trusted. And they were an expert in this area. You were an expert in this area. They were someone else, an expert over here. And by the time that team is all together, like you guys had a really good handle on on the risks. And and I'm familiar with the deals that that you're investing in, and you guys do a great job of mitigating that. But it's not all you doing the mitigation, but by the team and when you look in its in its yeah. entirety, you guys have it pretty well locked up. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, and I think it's important to kind of know where you know where the holes are. So I guess, Chad, how has your team grown since that first deal? You know, where what what have you kind of added as you scaled? Because I know we were talking here before the show, and you're going to eclipse a uh, hundred million here in, in the near future uh, with your portfolio, which is sig- a huge, significant milestone. Um, so what, what does your team look like now? How is it different than when you first started? Yeah. So, so going back to one of those risk factors for me starting up was I had to do a deal that was near me that I could be at. And and I did a lot of construction and value add on it. So that was important for me. So I did it like in my backyard, I I live in LA, um, and I was doing my syndications in Long Beach. 
you know, hour, hour and a half drive from me. So uh, that was because I could be there. Right. Yeah. Um, but then with uh, with all the uh, eviction moratorium stuff going on, uh, which, you know, we're here we are in January 2023 <laughs> and we still have an eviction moratorium here in L.A., um, I, you know, I, that, that to me was an increase in legislative risk. And how do I underwrite to an eviction moratorium? Like you can't, there's no way you can, you yeah. can't underwrite it to it. Cause yeah. it's not a, it's not a market thing, right? It's a, yeah. it's a legislative political thing. And, um, so, so to me, that was too much risk. So I, st- I actually stopped, stopped buying properties in, in California. Mm. Uh, they also initiated statewide rent control, um two yeah. years ago and uh and again like you just you can't you can't let you can't underwrite to something like that underwriting for those listening is like all the numbers the financial analysts uh, uh analysis of, of what you're doing yeah. uh which includes looking into the future known as a pro forma so so anyways there's a lot of risks there that california was introducing into my deals that i wasn't comfortable with so so then what I started doing is like what you do and partnering with other people out of state to do larger deals and rely more on a team instead of me doing everything. And uh, right now we're doing deals in Florida, uh, St. Petersburg, Orlando, Jacksonville, um, great you know, a thousand people yeah. a day moving to Florida. And it, it's a Incredible. great, it's a great yeah. uh, investment environment. It's a great growth environment for um, population growth, job growth. And, uh, and so we, we, we've been doing that. Um, my first, my first, um, co GP deal, uh, if you will, in Florida was a $53 million deal. So, um, which now I'm on the asset management team for and kind of navigating, you know, rising interest rates and, yeah. and all this stuff now. So it's, it's a great learning experience on working with a big deal. Uh, but there's, you know, five other, five other GPs that have a lot of experience in their own right. But when we put our, our minds together, um, we're doing great things with the assets. So it, it's pretty exciting. It's totally different than, you know, running a small deal on your own. Um, but very exciting and a lot of, a lot of upside, um, to do something like that. Yeah. Um, so I wrote my book. Oh man, I got to think about, um, Right around 2019, I think I, I wrote the book right before. Yeah, had it right before COVID hit. Um, this one, it. yeah, that was awesome. Hey, man, <laughs> and we're gonna talk about your book here shortly. So stay tuned. Uh, yeah, I just um, I just read it for a second time. Awesome. To brush man. up on things. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very it's a great much. Great book. Great book. I, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I bring that up because I want to highlight that you know you really exemplify that value add strategy with the properties that you're buying, Chad. So share a little bit about kind of where your sweet spot is with the properties. You're you're buying you know properties that are uh, typically kind of being repositioned into the B, which is you know just such a huge need. Like I was just reading this morning, we're, we're still housing starts, um, apartment starts, like even though there's a lot of supply that's being delivered here in the next year or so, we're, we're still not keeping up with demand. So how how are you taking advantage of that with your strategy and what's kind of your sweet spot, how, how you're focusing on um, targeting and then acquiring and improving these properties? Yeah. So, so I focus on value add, which basically means we'll, we'll buy a, a distressed asset or something that's a, a either older or just weathered, maybe some deferred maintenance. And, uh, and we fix it up and do what, what we call forced appreciation on the asset. So if, um, let's say I might be rent out for, you know, 900 bucks a month for a, a one bed unit that's really kind of beat up, we're able to fix it up and then, and then lease it out for maybe, you know, $1,100 or, or $1,200, something like that. Um, once we improve it, um, and what's, what's case is. As you kind of methodically go through the building, you never do everything at once, right? You just, you slowly go through the building for a variety of reasons. Um, but a lot of times what happens is, is your tenants will like move down the hallway or move to another floor because they want that nicer unit. There's yeah. virtually no moving costs, right? It's super cheap. Yeah. Uh, you already know the tenant. So it's like a win-win and, uh, and they get a much nicer unit than they were getting before. And um you know, we're not we're not taking advantage of people. These are just market rates for a nice unit, yeah. and people want nice places. Yeah. So, 
Um, so from that standpoint, that's the value add. We call it like a C-class type building. And after our improvements, the interior wise and also on the exterior, um, common area type stuff, we can get it to like a B-class apartment. Uh, and then for what we're doing on improving the community, we're rewarded for that as investors. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of like the 10,000 foot level of, of what we're doing. Um, from a macroeconomic standpoint, I totally agree with you. I mean, it, it, it is what it is. Like we're undersupplied housing in, in the U.S., right? And that's happened yeah. since the 08 crash when development basically came to a standstill and then it yeah. really just slowly creeped up. And, uh, and it took 10 years to get back to our 40 year average for, for housing builds, right? It's amazing. Uh, inventory. Yeah. That's a, that's a big lull. And, um, De and it's yeah, going to take us a long time. Supply. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. And then, and then when you put onto that, now you put on supply chain issues, you put on top of that inflation issues, like we're not going to get out of that hole for a long time. And if you combine if you combine the huge interest rates for single family home purchases, like single family homes, are unaffordable for a lot of people. And, and those people yeah. are now going to be renting a lot more than they would have otherwise. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a big issue. And um, so anyway, so I think with, with that inventory issue that we have, um, it's it multifamily, the Holy grail, as you mentioned in your book, right? <laughs> It's uh, not going to argue with that. Or, yeah. <laughs> I did read it twice. Um, low risk and higher reward for that asset class. And multifamily is continuing to be the holy grail, uh, in my opinion. And I know in your opinion of investments right now. No, I, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. And it's, it's you know, it's one of those um, trends that that's unfortunate for uh, somebody that might be on the other side, right? They want to buy a house. They want to do that. Um, but also this is, and you know, as, uh, you know, as I talk about kind of early on in the book or demographics, like if you want to be successful, just follow the tide, follow the rising tide, follow those areas of opportunity, which, which you guys are doing. I love the market you're in, Chad, um, Florida, Texas, the Southeast, you know, we're going to continue to see this migration there, especially as states like California imply some of these onerous, whether they're taxes or restrictions, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate reality that if you look at, you know, some of these um, cities and states that imply, I'm sorry, apply rent restrictions, it widens the gap for those that are trying to find a unit. And I think there's, you know, there, there's other ways um, to go about that, that, you know, don't kind of hold down those people that are trying to move up. Um, I was talking to um, uh, Tom Wheelwright uh, at, um, just um, about two months ago. Uh, we were at a meeting. I pulled him aside afterward, and we were talking. I said, "Hey, like, like what?" Um, and for those that that aren't aren't familiar, he's uh, one of kind of Robert Kiyosaki's kind of inside, um, you know, inside circle. And so he, you know, he's dealing with um, not only investors but also politicians at a very high level. I said, "Hey, how do we solve this?" And he said, "The only way to solve it is increase supply." He's like, "You just can't. You can't really do it any other way." And yeah. it's, uh, you know, so that's what I feel like we need to do. So you're, you're really increasing the supply of these, you know, affordable, you know, or workforce housing um, product, Chad, which, which I think is fantastic. Uh, real quick, because it, it may have been a while since we kind of touched on this. So if you would, for the audience, you know, tell us like, what's the difference between, you know, what we would call C class, B class and A class, like, how, how would you define that for the audience? Yeah, I mean, look, there's a few different factors um, that would help determine what class it is. And uh, I'll start saying it's very subjective, right? There's no very clear yeah. level of what it really is. But in, in general, you would look at the the age asset and the, the state of the asset uh, and, mm -hmm. and location of the asset. Those are like the three big factors that go into what class would be. So um, C class you know, would be uh, workforce, maybe lower, lower end workforce housing, uh, tends to be older buildings, you know, minimal amenities, if any, um, and some deferred maintenance like that, all those three things would would uh, put it into a C class. And, and you might think of it, um, you know, I would say like a D class would be like a slumlord 
a property. So like we might have in our mind, like what does a slumlord property look like? Yeah. That would probably be like a D class property where like you would not, you know, you would not yeah. go visit a D class property. You're only there if you really have to be. Yeah. A C class is is kind of nice, but it's it's um there's not like I said, no amenities. It might be a really older building. Maybe it's an up and coming area. Uh, but the the main thing is the building's just a bit distressed, a bit tired. Yeah. Um. So so, but you can you can move that C class to a B class, which would be like let's say just say like a, a much newer building. Um. They're in a less desirable area, but a nice building in a less desirable area. Or maybe it's an older building and it might have like low ceilings or spongy ways. Like it's just like designed um, not to today's standards from an aesthetic standpoint. And that could right. still make it a, a B class building even though it's fixed up nicer. You don't know what I'm saying? Yeah. And absolutely. then A class, A class is like what you might see like on brochures. Like, wow, like right. a lot of glass, a lot of high ceilings, nice finishes, um, nice gyms, you know, that sort of thing. Storage lockers for uh, like Amazon lockers. Like, a lot of stuff like wow i'd really like to live here um so that's kind of the a class and and so that's generally the spectrum and you have c plus you have b minus you know so yeah. you can get into some of these nuances um but but you know whether you call it a, a b minus call it a c plus like we can't argue who's right on that it's just right. what the feeling is yeah. um but generally you know like i like to move from a c class type property to yeah. a b class yeah we you know, I will I will disagree with you. I would say we can argue that because I argued really hard with the C plus okay. in college, and I got from a C plus to a B minus in my <laughs> English class. So, um, good yeah. on you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mentioned your book, Chad, and uh, I love it. Why entrepreneurs should invest in apartments, and you know, this is something that I think you know whether you're an entrepreneur, or business owner that's listening, or whether you're you know a salesperson as I was. I think there's a lot of um, you know overlap there, but you know, there's there's some lessons in your book that I think everyone can wrap their wrap their brains around and apply in their lives. So if if you would share share some of the things you talk about, like why everyone needs, especially entrepreneurs, need passive income. Talk about from your experience, you know, what you've seen, what you've lived as an entrepreneur, and ultimately now as a real estate syndicator, and you know, what you really learned and what people are going to learn when they see your and read your book. Sure. Yeah. So, so entrepreneurs are my, those are my people, my tribe, my affinity group. Um, I'm actually uh, a 10 year member of the entrepreneurs organization, which has been really helpful and support me in my entrepreneurial journey. Um, and, and in a nutshell, and, and you're right, it, it, it can translate a bit to, let's say a W2, like you were doing high end medical sales. A, a lot of these concepts do translate. Um, I would say in a nutshell, putting too many eggs in one basket, whatever that one income stream is, your main income stream, putting all your eggs in that one basket. And, and it could be like for a W-2 person, what if you get fired? Uh, medical sales, what yeah. if you have like a bad year because of the FDA or whatever, and like your yeah. your commissions go way down. Yeah, Entrepreneur, like we, we focus so much on creating and growing our business that, that that's all we focus on and that that helps give us the success that we have but it comes at a cost right the yeah. cost is like that's your only income stream and yeah. as we know businesses go through cycles and you're so busy running your business paying everybody else first right entrepreneurs yeah. always pay themselves last generally speaking and and then you know whether you sell the business or let's say the business goes through a downturn or, or something happens like that was your only income stream yeah. and the years prior to that issue where you were making a good enough money that you could have invested in something and created this passive income stream that will just grow and grow over time. Yeah. You could have done that. But a lot of entrepreneurs, they've got their blinders on and they're super successful what they do that they forget to take care of themselves in other areas or in the future. And yeah. so that's what I'm trying to open up people's eyes to. Yeah. No, I love it. And I think you know, what, what you're talking about there is something I've heard over and over again. And this, this is something I've heard from doctors, surgeons, um, you know, what I did medical device reps that were on call, you're earning such a high income, whether it's from your business or from your profession, but you say, I can't, there's no way I can do this another say 20 years. So you're 45, you've hit your stride. You're, yeah. you're doing great in your career. You got kids, you want to go see their games. You want to do things, but you're, you continue to be pulled and your financial advisor says, Hey, 
you're on the you're on a great track. No problem. You're going to be able to retire by the time you're 60, 65. And you're thinking, I can't do this another 20 years. And that's why I say you're not really free unless you have passive income. And that's what I love the message you're talking about, Chad, is, is how do you create these passive income streams consciously early on? We talk about using cash value life insurance to kind of build a base as a, essentially a private pension. Um, and the beautiful thing is it's not either or. You can use that to invest in real estate and get the benefits, you know, of both of these things. But yeah, and you know, if you're listening, you're thinking, well, I love what I'm I'm doing. I'm happy to work till I'm 60 or 65. Yeah, but would you be better at what you do if you didn't have to work? And I think the answer is yes. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I generally I'd say yes a hundred percent. But even if someone's no, oh, I really don't, I love my job, it's my passion, blah, blah, blah. Things happen. Like you could. You could, you know, health yeah. wise, let's say you're out yeah. of work for a long period of time, yeah. right? And you go on disability or something like that. Like yeah. it's not going to pay your bills. You're going to, you could be in a very, very difficult yeah. spot and worse off, you could put your family in a really difficult spot. God forbid yeah. something happens. So even if you don't need the money or, you know what I mean? You love what you do with the passion. That's great. But, you know, and, and you and I think of this as engineers, it's always good to have a good plan B, right? Oh this yeah. Can help you. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, yeah, as an engineer, you know, being in the OR, it's like, you always had to have a backup, um, plan A, plan B, plan C. And then I'd call it the, uh, the shit hit the fan plan. You know, what are you going <laughs> to, yeah. what are you going to do if, if all your, all your best laid plans, you know, go to waste? Like you got to have something that's going to, that's going to save the day. Um, so Chad, um, we're going to have the link here. If you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening in the show notes on how to get um, free copy of your book, Why Entrepreneurs Should Invest in Apartments. Um, what is the best way for listeners to get a hold of you, to reach out, to learn more about what you're doing, You know, not only with your book, but also what you're doing on the investment aspect? Sure. Yeah. So the best way is uh, just through all social media it can be uh, CSQ properties. So Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, you can see what we're working on. Um, also the website, csqproperties.com. And yeah, we have uh, the free ebook on there to, to download that kind of gives an overview of all this stuff. Yeah. If you're listening, get a free copy of Chad's book. It's free. I don't know why, why you would not do that. If you haven't got a free copy of our book, you can also get a free copy of our book at nextlevelincome.com. Just click on the book link. Chad, thank you so much for sharing your story, your experience, and your free book with the audience today. Sounds good. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Good to see you, my friend. Hey, Chris here again. I hope you found this episode valuable. Now I have one more thing to give to you. We have a page for my coaching clients where you can get a free copy of my book, as well as much more from previous guests on the show. Just check out nextlevelincome.com slash coaching to get a free copy of my book, audio book, and much more. I'll send you a copy of my book and cover all the shipping costs as a thank you for listening to the podcast. Also, please like, share, and take just 90 seconds to give us a rating on Apple Podcasts.